Thank you. All right, so the previous talk by IBM Watson told us how computers can assist genomics. And in my talk, we're going to explore whether genomics can help the computer industry. And the title of my talk is, Can We Store All of the World's Data on a Pickup Truck? And there are some serious attempts also made by IBM. I found this figure in Carfike 1956, trying to fit, to fit a five megabyte hard drive into a truck. And it needed about six men to, to do this uh, process. And today, quite remarkably, we have these devices that store 10,000 times more information and are more than 10,000 times smaller. And just remarkable, we take it for granted, but extreme miniaturization enabled these technological advancements in storage. Yet, we still have some challenges to overcome with storage. And I'm going to talk about two challenges. The first challenge is that miniaturization have become harder and harder in the last few years. What you see on this graph over here is the um, price for DNA storage per gigabyte over time. And from 1990 to 2010, there was a price decline of 40%, which is a remarkable. But since 2010, it became quite hard to keep miniaturizing these devices, and the price decline is only 15%. <coughs> The second challenge that we have in the storage industry is digital obsoleteness. Every time we come with a new technology, Apple introduces a new Mac or something like that, then you have new dongles that you need to buy, you have new types of hardware that you need to buy, and you need to migrate your data constantly. My parents have these beautiful videos from the 70s on 8 millimeter films. I cannot watch these videos anymore. It's gone. So digital obsoleteness is another challenge we have in the storage industry. So when thinking about these challenges, maybe we can find some inspiration in biology how we can solve these challenges. And what I would like to propose in the next few minutes is that DNA is the ultimate storage device. If you think about it, DNA has been around in the last three billion years. Whether you're a herpes virus, a cucumber, an elephant, or Donald Trump, you store <laughs> your most precious information, how to make cells in your body, on DNA. And just to give you the sheer magnitude of the success of DNA, if you think about the entire biosphere, we have about 10 to the power of 37 bytes sitting on DNA everywhere, from the, from the salad that you ate this morning to your own body. And this is about 15 orders of magnitudes more than all the digital information that is stored in the world. Now, the nice thing about DNA is that it's not going anywhere. If we put information on DNA and humanity loses the ability to read DNA, we had some major catastrophe. The hardware is going to stay for the next thousand years. It's not going anywhere. Okay. The second advantage of DNA compared to magnetic media, that it's extremely dense. So here is a, a microscope photo of magnetic media from 2013. And what you see, these beads that you see over there are the magnetic grains. Now you cannot store one bit on a magnetic grain because it's still uh, um, subject to errors. You have to use several magnetic grains, about 18 to store one bit of information. Now each one of these magnetic grains is the volume is 10,000 cubic nanometers and we could fit 10,000 DNA nucleotides at the same volume, which means if we have four options, A, C, G, and T, that we could fit 20,000 bits per magnetic grain, and in total, it's a one million times more denser than magnetic media. It gives us much better horizon to miniaturize our storage technologies. Another advantage of DNA is that it's extremely stable. If you look at your CD from the 90s, it looks like that, probably. Scratched, and it's hard to read. However, what is 20 years for DNA, right? We can still retrieve, we can still read DNA found in skeletons that are hundreds of thousands of years old. Very robust molecule. Okay, so all these advantages, kind of like I hope that I convince you that DNA is actually a very good choice to store information. But the question is how we can store synthetic information, not biological information. So let's just kind of like go through this process. Every type of information is just binary string of letters, zero and ones, whether it's be a movie, a document, or a computer program. 
DNA is made out of A, C, G, and T. So what we can do is a simple process. We can map, and this is the most simplest encoding technique. We can map 0, 0 to an A, <coughs> uh, uh, 0, 1 to a C, 1, 0 to a G, and 1, 1 to a T. And then as we keep reading the file, we can add more and more nucleotides. So essentially, you convert this binary information, represent it on a molecule. Now, how do we do this process in practice? Sometimes people think that we need to take a cow or a fish and extract the DNA and somehow manipulate the DNA. And it's not really like that. We can just use inkjet printers that were converted to synthesize DNA. These printers have four nozzles for A, C, G, and T, and they can print tiny spots of DNA and really grow these spots, as you can see in the process over here, into many, many molecules simultaneously. After you, have, you do conduct this process, and several companies today offer this technique, mainly for biological applications, not for storage. What you get essentially is your files on something that looks like that. A tube with DNA that is sitting around. Now you can take this tube with your files and you can store it. You just put it in, in a regular room temperature and it will be there for, for your years. If you want to keep it for thousands of years, put it in some cold place, maybe under a glacier or something like that, and you can read the information. Once you're ready to read your information, to retrieve it, you just go either to the sequencers that Gordon described to us in the previous session or this larger Illumina that he called mainframe sequencers. You read the DNA and then you decode back from the nucleotides into a binary file. And the cool thing about this storage technique is that it mainly leverages technologies that exist today we just need to perfect them and orchestrate them together in the context of DNA storage. So many things exist already off the shelf. So my group uh, about a year ago did um, an experiment. We published it in science and several groups also did some, some experiments in DNA storage, but our advantage, our technique that we call DNA fountain was able to reach the Shannon limit. So it's highly efficient. It's also the most robust technique to errors and noise. So you have this, let's say, if the DNA molecule breaks, if you have these sequencing errors, we can still read information accurately. And we have a mathematical coding technique that is extremely flexible and can adapt for various file sizes and error levels. In our experiment, we stored a movie, The Arrival of a Train, a French movie from the uh, 1890s, a computer operating system, and even an Amazon gift card. We took this... Uh, um, files, we synthesize them in DNA, put it in a tube, and then we read the tube using, the, we read the DNA using the DNA sequencers. We posted all of the sequencing data on a public website, the European Nucleotide Archive, that everyone can download. Then I contacted one of my Twitter followers, Paul. I never met a guy, and he was very interested in these experiments. And I told, hey, Paul, why don't you download the data, see if you can decode it in your hands. So he got the data, decoded the, the file, was able to retrieve the Amazon gift card, and then he bought for himself a book about machine learning because he's a nerd like me. <laughs> so it's not just it works in our hands, but we can actually transmit information using this technique to other people. Okay, so this is pretty cool, right? But there is a caveat. Think about every time that we read a file from a DNA, every time we take, we have the sample, we waste an aliquot of the DNA, right? So after some time, it will dry out. And to give you an emphasis of this problem, I want to talk about my daughter, Leah. She really in loves of this bloody Let It Go song. <laughs> if you're a parent, you understand that. We listen to this song like five times a day, right? Now, if I encoded this song on DNA, the sample will dry out like within a week. So what we, and in our sample, in fact, we had about 30, like 30 aliquots that we could use. But since this is DNA molecule and we can use the same enzymatic machinery that replicates your own DNA in your body, we can also apply it to our DNA storage, and we can just keep replicating the sample, right? So what we did is the following process. We replicated one aliquot 25 times. Then we took the copy, and we copied the copy 25 times. Then we copied the copy of 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 the copy, of the copy basically nine, like power of nine. So if we keep doing that for each aliquot, and this is an extremely cheap reaction, we could retrieve the information about 10 to the power of 15 times. And this is enough for all the let it go in the world <laughs> in one lifetime. And just to show you that this thing actually works, here is the movie, The Arrival of a Train. 
one of the one of the first movies in the film industry, and now also one of the first movies that survived nine what we call PCR reactions, these nine copying of copying and copying. And I want to tell you, this is a French movie. It's more difficult to, to put the data, but it still survived. And you can see the train is arriving perfectly from the DNA. OK, terrific. Another experiment that we tried to do was to see what is the dilution limit that we can get, we can take this sample. So this time, instead of copying the sample, we did a similar process than what you do in homopathy, that you keep like diluting the sample. We keep diluting the DNA, then we sequence the sample in order to see what is the limit, like what is the number of molecules that we need to get. And we're able to read perfectly the information after diluting the sample so many times that we reached a, a concentration of 215 petabyte per gram of DNA. Think about your laptop that you have. Your laptop, let's say if you have a good laptop, is about one terabyte of information multiplied by 200,000 laptops and I reduce everything into one gram of DNA. So to the best of our knowledge, this is the most dense human-made storage device that we can get. And it means now that if we take the entire war data, which is 10 to the power of 24, we could fit it on 10,000 or 10 tons of DNA. And 10 tons, maybe it's not a pickup truck, but a U-Haul truck, like a big one, a semi-trailer maybe. You can still put all this information, carry it around. Now, I was asked to make a bold prediction. So here is my bold prediction slide. What is the potential of DNA storage? I want to emphasize there are still challenges. This technology is very costly. It's costly mainly because DNA synthesis cost quite a lot of money. In our experiments, all this information that we put together cost us $7,000. And we encoded about two megabytes of information. So it's still, it's still not there yet for, for a, a commercial use, of course. But in biology, one advantage of biology is that we can scale things up quite quickly. We heard in the first session beautiful talks about sequencing. And sequencing used to cost $3 billion to do the first human genome. After we found the right trick how to do sequencing and how to scale it up, today it costs $1,000 within 15 years. If we can apply the same order of innovation, of cost reduction, to DNA synthesis, you can see here the cost per uh, gigabyte in magnetic-based storage devices that are also going to be cheaper, using the same rate of 15% per year. And if we can apply the same rate for DNA storage, within a decade or so, DNA storage might be cheaper than these uh, magnetic storage devices. And that's it for my talk. Thank you very much.